part two of the teachings for the new golden age by beloved ascended master Kuthumi, preparing teachers for the golden age. Master Kuthumi's experiences as St. Francis of Assisi. The minds, hearts and consciousness of many of mankind dwell within kindness, with reverence and with perhaps a little awe upon the lifetime of St. Francis of Assisi. Because this mass consciousness is directed toward the experiences of Francis, it stirs the etheric and Akashic records within my own consciousness and brings forth again the sweetness and beauty that I was privileged to feel through touching the hem of the Christ consciousness. In Assisi, I belong to a class called, by the mind of the senses, the nobility, which title, however, was shallow and empty of the inner meaning. I well remember during those gay and carefree days of my youth, how there pressed upon me from time to time a passing breath that contained an elusive scent and feeling of another realm to which somehow I felt that I had once belonged. As this experience intensified, the richness of my daily life palled upon my senses and an unrest arose within me that sent me often and more often into the beautiful countryside where my soul seemed to experience a temporary peace and this yearning and searching fire within me was for the time being allayed. I can remember yet lying on the green grass by the side of a small but very clear stream and hearing the rustle of the wind in the trees above my head while my soul, yet bound to the body, hovered on the brink of eternity, reaching, reaching, reaching toward an indescribable and unexplainable something of which I knew not, but which my soul in itself sought, knowing no restraint of reason. Those months and years when the body and the soul were at odds were strange and restless ones. For when the body sought its pleasures, the soul was distressed. And when the soul would burst its bonds of flesh, intent upon an individual search, which reason could not understand, the body, like a sulking child, restrained its pinioned wings and deliberately set obstacles before its groping, upward reaching. There was no peace within me, and, according to my family and friends, there was no peace around me, nor in my company, for I was torn between allegiances to both these factors that seemed determined in themselves to secure supremacy over my going out and my coming in. This day I speak of when the sky was blue and the wind was not aggressive, but gliding through the trees in playtime fashion, the soul within me, which always received the greatest impetus in the cathedral of nature, was in the ascendancy of my outer self, like a good natured baron, contemptuously allowed it a few hours of freedom. All at once, during her faltering, stumbling flight, searching, seeking, reaching, there came a great light and within that light was the perfume, the fullness of all that my soul had sought. Within it also stood a beautiful being whose outline became clearer as the trembling of my heart was stilled 
And then I saw the most beautiful face that ever God ever created. Then I somehow knew that in that majestic presence, I saw myself as I was meant to be and the words spoken so many centuries before swept through my memory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And I also realized that this shining vision set before my eyes was the Father's example of what all men should become. The great Master Jesus, for it was he, did not speak, but yet the love that poured from his presence filled me with a courage, a strength, and a feeling that, from the shapeless mass which I yet expressed, there could be fashioned such a being as he. I felt the presence of the Father, and I knew that in Jesus, the Father had given me a glorious manifestation of himself, hoping that it would bring to our remembrance the glory we had with him in the beginning. The vision vanished and I felt that I was no longer alone, but that I had a purpose and a memory that became the impulse of my life. No longer was there a question, but that all my being must now be bent toward becoming the Son. I knew that not only the Father, but also the beloved Jesus filled my spirit from that hour henceforth, and all the miracles that have been accredited to Francis are but the blessing of the Holy Trinity, which through me endeavoured to bring to mankind's attention again the example of the beloved Son in whom the Father was well pleased. Perhaps this simple, homely talk may give you, my friends, a little courage or comfort, and perhaps, in a major sense, purpose. May I again offer you the blessing that has become associated with my name May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May he show his face to thee and have mercy on thee. May he turn his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May the Lord bless thee. Amen. We now have additional experiences of Guthumi as St. Francis of Assisi. In my days in Assisi, the great crusades were going on to draw the holy sepulchre from the hands of the infidels. I, among many hundreds and thousands of greater men, marvelous warriors, knighted soldiers and crusaders of merit, within my own heart, felt that I, too, would like to see and bless the birthplace of that great and beloved Jesus, who had given to me illumination and that freedom which I knew. So, I proceeded as best I could, with nothing but my habit and that which the kindly folk along the way provided in the way of food, securing by constant and conscious prayer, passages in various boats and parts of various caravans. I admired much the magnificent armour, the blazing swords, the shining helmets of all those brave men who wore the cross of the Crusaders. 
They never thought much of me. We finally arrived at the Holy Land. Never shall I forget when I placed my feet upon that earth and I felt the pulsation that still remains from that vibrant figure who walked that earth some centuries before. While the mighty army of crusaders prepared their lavish plans and were gathered together, wetting their swords upon the stones, and while they fitted their coats of mail, I walked across the forbidden land and I met with the Prince of the Infidels. And we stood side by side at the Holy Sepulchre. And do you know, we were brothers. We were one. When I walked back, the Crusaders asked me where I had been and they were amazed and disbelieving. In my life in Assisi, I had all the wealth and happiness of a young man of good family, surrounded by gentle folk, and my life knew naught of the thorns of oppression that often turn people to God. The godly impulse began to awaken within my heart without any invocation except that which I now know came from my mother's heart. When I became immersed in the deep, devoted love for Jesus, my life became one of strange calm and inner peace, which continued to grow as I left the ways of men and entered the heart of the silence. For many years, this unfolding presence expanded within me, never by preaching, but by radiation did I secure a disciple. For me, the path of the silence was not one of repression or suppression, but the beauty of God's presence in my heart was so great that my outer self was in a constant state of loving adoration before the gift that God had afforded me in that unquenchable burning flame. I felt so at one with that flaming presence. I learned that I could find it burning in the hearts of all I contacted. Through their eyes, I saw the reflection of the love of God that was within my presence. It was found in the flight of a bird or the patter of the wild folk of the forest. In all of that, I heard the pulse beat of my father's heart. And as I entered deeper into a grateful submission to this power that began to flow through my arms and entire being with a warmth and a peace that made me seem constantly held within the embrace of an angelic form. I began to hear and see through the veil. When a man is accorded this privilege, he finds no need for words. Sometimes after six or seven days, as I walked through the woods, I would find that seven or eight disciples would have joined me and walked silently in my aura. I would accept them and break bread with them in the silence. They said that somehow they were uplifted beyond the thinking of their minds and the feeling of their bodies. And they were able to see and know more of God when they were near me. Thus, I pursued a singularly quiet course and the great numbers of monks and sisters that formed the orders of St. Francis were endowed with the spirit of that great all-encompassing life which I myself endured. In the homes and hospitals of St. Francis, 
there is that continual outpouring of impersonal love of life.